From UBN Studios, you're listening to Unsugarcoated with Alia, bringing you interviews with public figures and inspirational people, speaking on self-improvement with empowering themes. And I'm your host, Alia Lanius. Hello, and welcome to another amazing episode of your favorite social good podcast show, Unsugarcoated with Alia. I'm so happy to be here. Um, though, I got to tell you, Okay, so we were in the studio yesterday filming, or the other day, excuse me, Monday, and when I left, I started to get alerts on my phone. And I'm not gonna use my entire time to really talk about this, but I, but I am gonna use a portion of it. So as many of us know, Roe v. Wade seems to be um, getting the overturn from the Supreme Court right now. We can expect that this, if, if it's the same draft of what we're seeing now that was put out by Samuel Alito, um, and looking at how the court is comprised now of conservative versus, you know, quote unquote, literal, these liberal, these titles, right? Um, we do seem to have this vote that will overturn a very um, significant human right law. And the one thing I'm going to say about it is this. Do, no matter what side of the coin you are on, and I have to speak to this unsugarcoated because if I don't, I feel I am doing a disservice to myself as a woman and to my community as women. The reality of any, even if you are the person who's like, this law is going to change things. This is a solution to a problem of, of women terminating pregnancies, right? Uh, ending a, a conception. The problem is it's not going to turn out the way that you envision it to, right? This is not a law that's going to take away human right of a woman's right to choose what's right for her body and her future. To then say, okay, oh, well, we'll all just do it, <laughs> you know? And I got to share with you, you know, to any person that I've had that conversation with that, you know, is a self-proclaimed pro-lifer, which to be quite honest to those people, I've found them more to be pro-conception because I've asked them, have you gone to the foster homes? Have you gone to the orphanages? Because I have. You know, even when I was 18 years old, I used to go into Mexico. And to give you a bit of context on that, very Catholic culture, uh, uh, contra contraception is not actually, you know, especially 30 years ago, was not really like the greatest thing. It was culturally not acceptable. So you had so many people having children because their culture told them to, but they couldn't afford them. And I got to tell you, it's one of the most heart wrenching things to go one day a month and spend a day with these dozens of children living bunk bed to bunk bed. Just so the look in their eye when we would leave you guys, okay? When you take away, it's, I know that everyone wants every life to live, but I'm a cancer survivor. I've said goodbye to people. We know that a lifespan can be in utero, it can be two days, it can be five months, it can be 10 years, it can be 90. And I know that for a lot of us, the challenge of who gets to dictate when that is and when that isn't is an issue of contention, I understand that. However, life and death are part of our existence. Okay. But to take away the right to choose and force women to have to, you know, okay, I'm in California, I can say for now, probably my daughters and my granddaughters will have a choice, which is what I'm arguing for, right, is the states that don't, the states that are so on edge to take that away, that the women that will be in the bathrooms with a coat hanger, the women that will do acts out of pure desperation, that's what I need you to consider as we have this conversation. Because if you're not considering the fact of what this means to the person who will have to make that choice for themselves and will seek out every opportunity to do so, what about their life, right? So listen, that's how I want to say, I, I hope that people will respect, I'm merely sharing my opinion on the matter, which I do have one in it. And guess what, I have a stake in the game because I'm a woman because I have three daughters, because they might have daughters, and I care about them much more I care about my community and every other woman out there. So thank you. Now that we're past that, I, you know, I hope you can respect it. And we will do our thing. We will continue focus on social good. I have an amazing guest for you guys today. And it's interesting because, you know, to be honest, even if you kind of take it to the thread of what uh, women and men in general we live with in our lives of how do we we plan for these futures, we put these goals in front of ourselves, we have these dreams for our, our each other and, and ourselves. And yet there is usually external and ex internal voices that are saying, oh, how are you going to do that? Oh, you're not good enough. Oh, people are going to find out you're a fake. Um, 
that's the people that we need to talk to today, right? That's the people we are talking to because, you know, I do wonder how many people out there have a deep sense that they are intended for something so much more, but they ref they fail to rise to their occasion because there's something inside of them that says you can't do it. And, you know, there's the negative self-talking, there's the creating of self-doubt, there's even self-sabotage. So, you know, I want to even use myself an example. I, I will say, and so I'm going to use the words imposter syndrome because that's really what we're talking about today. What it is, what is, isn't. I have an amazing expert to talk on this, but I just want to give you guys like the heads up of my own journey. You know, I, I remember sitting in a crowd of people and seeing somebody on stage and share their story and I would see the crowd become invigorated by the powerfulness of it. And knowing my own story and knowing that I had something inside of me, I remember looking at those people and being, I can do that too. And not only do I, not like from a pure ego of like, oh, I want all these people cheering for me. It's because I felt I had that same power. But immediately, of course, a voice comes and says, well, how are you going to do that? But you either decide that you're going to build the opportunity, create the opportunity, build the platform that you're going to speak on, which I did when I launched EmpowerCon at Los Angeles Convention Center and had that amazing same experience, or you're going to let, you're going to stay that person who never, you know, but you're not doing what you need to do. And since, you know, it, it, that is what we, we know our theme has been trusting the process, trust the process. How do we trust the process? What goes into the trusting the process? And why does that benefit us personally, in our family, in our work, in our, in our community? So I'm so excited to have this conversation. I've known our guest for about a year now, and I've heard her speak on this so many times that I'm like, oh, gosh, I've got to have you. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it. Our guest today, Shara Anjanette, is an author, international speaker, thought leader, and founder of Anjanette Wellness Academy, Performance Alliance, and AWI Media. With more than 30 years experience in the business arena and founder of an integrative marketing agency, Anjanette was privileged to work across many industries and was the recipient of 10 Markham Awards for her work as the managing publisher for two industry magazines. Anjanette is known to those she works with as the Mind Guide. She holds certifications across multiple disciplines for advanced training that includes strategy, performance technology, cognitive behavioral neuroscience, neurolinguistic programming for brain health, stress, anxiety, and self-regulation. Considered an expert on the topics of imposter syndrome, burnout, and peak performance, her book, The Imposter Lies Within, is a journey past imposter syndrome, helping others learn how to address self-doubt, say goodbye to self-sabotage and just overall learn to embrace your badassery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Cheryl and Jeanette. Hi, Alia. Good to see you. So good to see you too. I love you. I appreciate you. I know we're often on Clubhouse hearing each other. You know, you do, you do amazing things. You hold amazing spaces there. I'm so excited to have you on our platform today with our audience sharing your amazing wisdom. Tell our audience where you're speaking to me from today because you are joining us via Zoom. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in San Diego, California. Sunny, sunny California. Uh, yes, sunny gorgeous. San Diego. Um, <laughs> so first of all, you know, thank you for joining me. Can can you, I, we shared a little bit about your background, but I'm so excited because you have this amazing book that you just released. Congratulations, right? Your, thank your you. baby. How did it feel to hold it in your hands? Oh, it's amazing. It's It's like everybody says, when you see those pictures and someone's suddenly holding their book, it came, it's, it feels like your baby was just born. It's amazing. <laughs> it really does. How have, you know, how's been the response to it? I know a lot of people have just, excuse me, been, you know, feeling impacted by it. What, what's it like to get these positive responses that you are? Um, well, it feels amazing. And, you know, it's still pre-launch. The lot P official launch is May 11th. Right. But a lot of people have this in their hands. They've read it. They've been kind of part of the process or I've given them an advanced copy. And, you know, the reception is beyond my wildest hope. And I even have, you know, um, psychologists, psychotherapists that are saying, wow, this book is really going to, you know, be a classic. It's going to be an important book for a lot of people. And so that that's been very, very meaningful amazing I love it I was over here trying not to choke on some 
I'm coughing. Sorry, but I love it. I I do. I I have. I'm honored to have an an early advanced copy. I have to say, it's amazing. So, what is and what isn't imposter syndrome? Yeah, that's a, a important point. Uh, an important question, I should say, and a really important place to start because there are a lot of myths around imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome is a psychological pattern where someone feels like they're not good enough in spite of their accomplishments. So there's an emphasis on the word pattern because this does become pattern. It's not just our behaviors and our actions that become pattern, but our beliefs, our thoughts, our self-talk all become patterned. And in spite of because there's a disconnect between how we feel and our actual accomplishments. It's like a dif the difference between perception and reality, right? So yes, I know if you look at my accomplishments, I know I'm a really accomplished person. I have the degrees, I've had the roles in business or what have you, wrote the book. And yet inside, I still feel like someone's going to figure it out. Someone's going to expose me for not being as good as they thought I was or others thought I was. It feels like the gig's going to be up at any moment. Yeah, I love that. I, it's interesting for me. <laughs> Sorry, I say this because it's interesting that I think one of the ways that I handle my branding message is to I let people know I'm not perfect. I want them to know I've made mistakes, right? I want them to know uh, my greatest abilities come from my flaws. And I right. think that for me personally, I'm saying, and so, um, you know, I can really understand. So are there moments that you've ever experienced imposter syndrome? I mean, how has it oh. shown up personally for you? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. You know, I talk about seven archetypes. I have a whole framework so people can really self-assess and understand how this is showing up for them and what the costs are. And in this framework, you know, there is the perfectionist, but there's also the people pleaser, the, the master who needs just one more degree or certification to be good enough, the lone ranger who has trouble delegating and is afraid to ask for help because they might be found out as not good enough. There's the savior, the superhero, the prodigy that feels like they have to go from zero to hero or beginner to mastery immediately right. just to be good enough. You know, and so I've experienced all seven of those archetypes, all seven in spades, which, you know, sounds harsh, but truly by understanding it and understanding how it showed up for me, I've been able to get past it. So one of the things I would say is you don't have to live with this. You can get past it, but it takes more than just dealing the fear and doing it anyway. It's interesting because like I look at body dysmorphia, right? Something I've personally experienced. It never really goes away, but I learn how to manage it. I've learned how to like I've evolved. And I love that you say that because it's so true. I mean, even myself, when I speak on some of the issues, it's because I have gone through it. I feel my personal experience also contributes. It's not, you know, we're all different, but you you know, I think what you speak to is something that everybody can really relate to. And I love that you even talk about it being different times at different points in your life and different versions of it. So I think that uh, that's incredible. What um, in order, I mean, you and speaking, going to archetype, you have it broken up, uh, the book itself, you have it in awareness, and then you have it, you know, you take it through um, that first, what is the awareness that you're bringing to people through your work? Yeah, so in the awareness, phase or stage, whatever you want to call it. And there are four awareness, insight, alignment, and integration. So the awareness is the most important because so often we're only partially aware or not really aware. We kind of see our behaviors and we think it's the behavior, but really there's more going on below the surface. And so it's not until we do the deep dive, we go into the beliefs and really even below the beliefs, what were the experiences that we had gave a meaning to that created that belief? So what happened early in life and through life where something happened and we interpreted it at a certain way, in a certain way, at a certain age. And then we started to have this belief of, oh, I'm not good enough, or I could never do that, or I'm not worthy, 
or deserving. These are so common with the imposter syndrome experiences. So we start to get that awareness below the surface. And it is a process of uncovering and discovering, but then putting it into a meaningful place where we can say, okay, I see that I'm really, I, you know, I've got all these people pleasing um, um, behaviors. Where are they coming from? You know, for me, it was really interesting, Alia, because I had this amazing father, like a beautiful man. He was so loving and so kind and um, so generous. And yet, um, I say, and yet, because that was all true, and we don't like to say anything negative about someone that we love and care for so much. But he was also controlling, and he used to have this behavior where if he got upset or if he and my mom were arguing, which they didn't really argue in front of us, so it would just kind of happen, um, he would leave. He would go and take a drive. That was his way of kind of blowing off steam, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was very innocent. You know, he was just handling it. Oh, I, I'm frustrated. I'm going to just, you know, take a drive and I'll be back. But as a little girl, I interpreted that as abandonment. Even though he always came back, I always questioned, is he abandoning? Where, where did daddy go? Why did he leave? Right. Why is he mad? Was it my fault? Did I do something wrong? You know, so I didn't realize that I had all these behaviors getting into a marriage that was not positive at all for, a lot. you know, I was with this person for 11 years, doing a lot of people pleasing, you know, kind of uh, subjugating myself to everyone else, not setting boundaries, never saying no, and putting myself last. And I did all of this really from this core root of fear of abandonment. Now, had you asked me at the beginning of this journey, do you have abandonment issues? I would have said, no, not at all. Are you kidding? I grew up in this incredibly blessed life. I had two loving parents. I mean, no not me no. So awareness is huge because we can get to those root causes, if that makes sense. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, even as a cancer survivor or like, even when I talk about people who addiction and re in recovery, like the disease of something deeper that is really causing these exhibitions, you know? Um, so same thing as I had mentioned the body dysmorphia and same thing with what you're talking about now and unlocking those uh, are very, very important. They help you to become more emotionally intelligent. You cannot change the past, right? But you can definitely change your future. Y yes, so, so let me just, kind of um, speak into that sure into this idea of you cannot change the past so we have our experiences right the experiences themselves don't change but as we all know two people can have the exact same experience and walk away with a different meaning correct and a different weight a different weightiness the way it affects them right so when we have an experience we attach a story to it right we get an emotion that we feel in our body. And oftentimes that emotion gets stuck, that creates dis-ease or disease. Um, but then we have the story and the story is the feeling, right? That's the narrative, that's the feeling. So I have a feeling about what just happened and I feel it in my body, right? And that informs our thoughts and that informs our self-talk, that dialogue that's going on and on and on, but between our ears, right? The conversation 100%. between me and me. Yeah. No, I love that you said that this is so true. And I and the minute you said that, I'm like, okay, I know where she's going because you're so right. You and, and I agree with you to emphasize and wholeheartedly agree with you because even when I've dealt with like sexual abuse examples and when you and other women and you have if it's about reframing it too and understanding yes. like you just said it was not your fault and it doesn't change your worth or value so I mean I completely agree with you and, and love love that you mentioned that because with especially regards to trauma right I mean there's several right. studies you're all you know neuroscience I love you and I always connect on that because I believe our brain is that computer our belief systems are upgraded we're programming yep. it we're telling it our, our operating system how to yes. you know right so how do you um how do you really see your work creating that impact 
in the people that you, because outside of the book, you've been working with people for several years, yes. right? Tell us about that journey for yourself and where neuroscience. No, so what happens um, with any, um, I want to call it like the sandbox of emotions, right? The emotions and the thoughts and the self-talk kind of play together and beliefs. And with any experiences, we have those interpretations and we have an emotion. And depending on the emotion, our brain is like a pharmacy. Our brain will throw out, you know, hormones and neurotransmitters and, you know, our own drugs, right? So there's like a stress cocktail of um, cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline. And then, you know, when you have pain, we, um, you know, we have our own pain medication. We can become addicted just like we would to pills we take over the counter. So we have to be really, really careful because we have this emotion. Now, when I say change a story or how we see that, I want to be really, really clear. This is so important. It doesn't mean pretending like that emotion wasn't there. Right. It's really important in this process to honor every emotion. Emotions are not good or bad. They're a language, right? And we have to listen to them because when we have an emotion like anger or sadness or loneliness or shame or blame, if we can shine a light on that, if we can honor it, if we can try to understand it, then um, we can say, okay, is this something that I could not diminish, but can I find another way to rewrite the story around this that will empower me and help me to move forward? What is there that... Um, maybe wasn't good at the time, but can serve as, you know, a new level of seeing this it, that's good for now and good for the future. You know, so for example, when someone's gone through trauma, perhaps that made them more resilient. And perhaps that trauma gave them insight into themselves and others they wouldn't have had. And maybe they can get to a place in life where as they heal that trauma, they can help others. So that becomes a new story a new place to kind of launch from, if that makes sense. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I mean, because obviously, you know, specifically to imposter syndrome, how do the thoughts, feelings, and beliefs and our past tra uh, traumas contribute to imposter syndrome? Well, at the core of imposter syndrome are these feelings of I'm not good enough, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not deserving, right? Mm -hmm. Don't matter, or my voice doesn't matter. So if we can go and do that deep dive to that young child. If I go back and I talk to myself at three years old or at four years old or at five years old, I can let that small child emote. Now, I don't mean going back into a trauma. Right. I don't believe in reliving trauma, um, but we can go before it, above it, around it, almost like an observer. And we can talk to that child in a traumatic situation the wounded child, the wounded inner child, either got something they shouldn't have gotten, like abuse, or they didn't get something that they should have and that they needed, like love and nurturing and belonging. Or maybe both of those things were happening. So when we revisit that child, first and foremost, we can help them feel safe. Look, you're safe now. Look at me. Look, I've grown into this adult woman. I have these successes. We are resilient. You're safe now. This isn't happening anymore. We want to make sure, almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that they feel safe, that they're okay. Then we want to make sure that they're feeling listened to and that they're getting that nurturing. They're getting that love that they were missing. You see, mm -hmm. we want to hear them. We want to hear what they're thinking. What are you feeling now? I'm here for you. And she might say, I'm scared. I'm really afraid that comes out a lot, or I'm really angry, or sometimes I'm afraid. And then once they get past the fear, it's I'm angry or vice versa, whatever it is, that child, I feel alone. I'm confused. I feel confused. I feel really lonely. Right. I don't know why nobody wants to play with me. Why don't they want to play with me? You know, whatever that is, but it's a child that we're talking to. And then as we do that, we can help them rewrite their story, meaning, look, I'm here with you now. Let's go play together, shall we? Right. Or 
look, you're okay. You see, you're not alone anymore. I'm here with you. I've got you. And then we ask them, do you want to come back with me? Would you like to come back into my life now and be a part of it? And most of the time they say yes, not always. Sometimes we have to go back a few times and they have a little more to work out and then they come, but we integrate them in. It's like the parts of us that got left behind. Mm -hmm. Parts of us that weren't respected, weren't loved, weren't heard. And we let them know you matter. Your voice matters. It does. You you are enough. You are deserving of everything. And we teach them how to receive. Because when we don't feel deserving, we just don't even know how to receive. Giving, yes. yes. Giving, okay. But receiving, and it's it's sort of like I have them put the hand out. The universe is just there. The universe is right here. It's waiting to pour into you. The only thing that's stopping it is you. And when we can learn to receive that, it comes through us. It's an energy. It comes through and we give and it keeps going and it's expansive. It's beautiful. It, you know, it, when I, knowing your book, I also know you, you talked and you mentioned the word a moment ago, alignment. And when you're talking yeah. now, it just makes me think of alignment. And, you know, yes. alignment is a beautiful thing if you have a couple of tubes and you're putting them together and they're not situated. But, you know, you get them aligned and this flows, this energy that flows through. So, you know, yeah. I hope that our audience is capturing that because... Um, because you talk about alignment and you speak about it, not just to the wounded inner child, the inner critic and, you know, the self-sabotager and then habit connection. What, which part of working through these um, is when you see the impact, what, what does that do for you? How do you feel about that? Seeing people come through and, and develop better habits for themselves and, you know, achieve <sighs> things like weight loss or growing a business that they have, you know, something, but like, cause you've dealt with physical as well as business. So how does yes. it feel? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really holistic, whole person, whole life. And everybody's in a different starting point, right? And everybody has sort of a different set. So that's why we go through a journey of awareness and insight and alignment and integration. But different people are going to work. Everybody works a little bit on everything. But some things you can pass right through. You kind of got that. And this other thing is a stickler for you. And for someone else, it's it's not as hard. And so sometimes when we come together as a group, that's beautiful because we can help each other. But it feels amazing to me because I've really dedicated my life to this now. And, you know, as much as I want this for someone else, what I always say is I'm only a guy. You know, if you were to climb Mount Everest, would you climb it yourself? Or would you do the climbing? Yes, you do the climbing. Would you carry your own back? Yes, you'd carry your own pack. Would you carry your own oxygen? Absolutely. But you would still have a guide. You'd have a Sherpa, right? right? You wouldn't go up Mount Everest without it. And so what I always say is, I love, like, I want this so much for everyone, but somebody needs to really want it for themselves because there's a commitment. You know, it gets hard sometimes. It's, we've gotten so good at using avoidance and escapism numbing it and getting you know distractions so we don't have to deal with the thing and when we stop which we all kind of did through this pandemic when we're forced to stop or we choose to stop and shine a light that's where the insight in sight inside really comes and then we can figure out what's out of alignment right and you know alia if you think about a combination lock and you had five dials, it's kind of like getting each of the dials, the numbers right, and all of a sudden the lock opens. If you get four right, but the fifth one is not, it doesn't truly unlock. Can you share with us a story, nothing personal, but can, is there, you know, do you, you have the people who succeed? What happens to the people who don't? Like how do, you know, how does that affect your life if you don't? address these issues and you do what does a life with imposter syndrome look like 
Well, I think if somebody is working on it and they stop before they've really gotten past it, which doesn't have to take years or decades like it did with me, it can be, you know, a few months. It's not overnight. There's no um, silver bullet. But I think they'll have techniques and they'll do better. It won't be quite as painful, you know, so they do better no matter what. But I think that's where most other you know, experts in this area stop is with the techniques, you know, you can try this, do that, put together your brag list. I call it the badass list. (laughs) And, you know, really keep reminding yourself of those accomplishments and, you know, let things go at 80%, you know, get used to being imperfectly you. And they go through a lot of these techniques that I also teach but they don't really do the deep dive, the inside out work. They don't get to the root or they're just working on the root, but they don't repattern the mind because you know through neuroscience that we need to repattern the mind. We mm-hmm. do have these um, neural pathways that form. And so we can bounce back to those old patterns if we're not really consciously doing this. So for people that don't get all the way through, they'll do better. Mm-hmm. You know, life will be easier. Um, they'll have more coping strategies. Uh, but for the people that really get past it, it's it's amazing. It's it feels like a flow. It feels like you're in flow. It feels like peace. It feels like you know life can be hard sometimes, and things do happen. But it's like okay, I've got this. I know how to get myself back to the center. You know, I talk about this concept called the healthy zone and I know how to get myself back into the healthy zone, Right. you know, and, and we do it right. We do it. Yeah. State of flow. I love, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's, it's exactly. And, you know, cause that was my next question. So what does it look like when someone is able to walk a path of full integration? You know, um, I know that your book touches on, on clearing the limiting beliefs and resetting the self-talk. Yes. You know, um, like, yeah, it's, a. I can only, for you, you obviously you've, you've written this book. It comes from your soul. You've arrived at this place where you, you now can get back in your state of flow and things, but you know, how, how has that process, I guess, most like share with me a moment where you had to overcome imposter syndrome in your own life, if you could. Well, um, oh, there were so many in business. Um, you know, I had a father, I've talked about my father a lot, but my, my dad was, you know, a good role model. He was an entrepreneur and he, you know, he faced his fears. So I had the model of someone facing their fears. So even when I didn't feel good enough, I kind of felt like I had to put myself out there and face the fear. So when I was um, pretty young in my career, I was uh, running the retail portion for, you know, this this company, and um, I had gone into a meeting, and there weren't that many people in the meeting. It was maybe eight or ten of us, I think. And someone called on me to speak, and I don't know if anybody's ever had a fear of public speaking, but I went to speak in this meeting, and like, oh, my heart was pounding. I could barely get the words out. I thought, how am I going to get out of this? And I was just mortified by the way I showed up. And so I went to the um, CEO of the company and I said, you know, I'd like to put together a seminar program and I'd like to go out and speak to professional women in the workplace on nonverbal communication skills because it, you know, kind of works with our business and this is how it relate back. And so I put myself in that mix but one of the things that would happen is i'd be set up to go and sometimes i went and sometimes i did i pushed through my fear and i did it anyway but i had such anxiety about it all the time how did i do what did they think i don't think i can do this i know i've done it before but there's no way i can do this again and sometimes i would just um you know, make up an excuse or quit, you know, like, you know, the quitter, the prodigy, right. I would just kind of come up with an excuse why I couldn't do that one. Right. And it was just passing up an opportunity. Um, 
And it was so agonizing for me every single time. Now, when I go up to speak, I still get a little bit of that butterflies in the stomach and, you know, the doubt will come in like, oh, am I going to do a good job? But, you know, doubt is a good thing in the healthy zone. Doubts are discernment muscles. So then it just puts me in my checklist. Okay. Did I prepare? Do I know what I'm talking about? Is what I'm going to say, is it going to help somebody? You know, I go through my checklist and I get excited and I don't have that anxiety anymore. You know, mm-hmm. I get a little bit of fear. I get a little bit of doubt, but in a really healthy way. And they give me energy and I just step right out. And I'm, you know, I, I just think, you know what? This is a moment where I have an opportunity to impact someone in a great way. And I'm not going to pass that up. Mm-hmm. I love that because it resonates with me. It's funny. You know, our theme, as I had mentioned uh, before for our, our podcast, this, this season is trusting the process, right? And yeah. I love that you share that because, of course, there's, there's the um, focusing on the value you bring, but knowing it first, right? Because how can you show up with the value if you don't even realize or recognize or acknowledge that you have it? Um, yes. And having faith in the unknown. Right. And and like taking just across everything that you just said and, and and visualizing even success. I love that you said that. And I love that you used it as an example, because even, you know, if doubt makes us vulnerable, how can we overcome that? I think that's right. some of the things that you're addressing in in your in your book and in in your career in general. I know that you have always been working with people to show up and be the best version of themselves. And I will, if it's okay, I, there's this you know quote that's at the very first page of your book. It's it's unknown, so I don't think I'm, <laughs> but I I loved it so much because I think it speaks to everything that we've been talking about. Um, ships don't sink because of the water around them ships sink because of the water that gets in them don't let what's happening around you get into you and weigh you down is this your call to action to people out there trying to live a better quality of life and overcome past traumas yeah absolutely absolutely we let so much in so let's take a look let's get rid of the baggage And then let's ground ourselves, put ourselves in the eye of the storm. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. Keep yourself in the eye of the storm in your own peaceful place and be discerning about who you let in, you know, people, you know, whatever it is, let your environment, you know, be organized and beautiful for you. However you want to do that. Um, I remember we were working with families in Darfur and during the genocide, my son was young and we were putting together these kits. And one of the things we did is we would, they, they had these cookers because they didn't want to have to leave the campground to go out to get food because they could get hurt, raped or what have you. And so we gave them these solar cookers and we gave them all the things that went with them so they could cook their meals right there. And all they had were these tents. And we created these myths for them because they, we, we realized that they'd only have, these women would only have the one dress they had on and they would take their dress and they would try to put it around this hot pan to bake it up and they were hurt, they were burning their dress. So we said, oh, we need to add some myths to that so they can pick up these cookers and not hurt their dress. And so then we started decorating them. We would decorate them and draw on them and, and then we found out that they would hang these up. It was their only decoration in their home, but they made their environment a place where they realized other people cared, other people were with them, other people were trying to do what they could to help them through, and it lifted their spirits. And so I say, wherever you are in your life, find some beauty find an environment that is going to serve you and nurture you even if it's just a small decoration find the people around you that really care about you you know look for get rid of the people if you can or put them on the back burner if you can't keep them outside 
they're part of the storm. They don't get to come in the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. If they're still around and you can't really get away from that, just put yourself in the eye of the storm in your mind and you will find your peaceful place. I can appreciate that. And I also want to say a happy early anniversary to you because you will soon in August be celebrating your second year of wedding bliss with your husband. I definitely. Oh, goodness. Look at that. (laughs) Look at that. You know, imposter syndrome and and relationships. You know, if we could just take a couple minutes, you know, how do you feel imposter syndrome comes into play in that scenario? It comes into play in all of our relationships, our romantic relationships, our friend relationships, our family relationships, our work relationships, you know, parent to child, siblings, um, but coworkers and with our bosses, because when we're exhibiting perfectionism or people pleasing or a superhero behavior, there are a lot of unintended consequences. So for example, the people pleaser, we think we're doing everything. We want to say yes. We never want to say no. But one of the unintended consequences of being a people pleaser, you can see my dog going in the back there. He's like a little pony. One of the unintended consequences of being a people pleaser is that when you subjugate yourself and you continually do for everyone else and you put yourself on the back burner, you end up feeling resentful and you can feel like a martyr, like the victim. You see, oh, I'm doing everything for everyone else. Don't they see? Don't they see? Or I can't believe I just did all that for that person and I feel resentful. Why didn't they do X, Y, Z for me? But it's not really that other person's fault, right. right? They didn't set that point. So when we lack boundaries, when we're unable to say no, when we're out there being a perfectionist and we're seeing every flaw, we can become an other oriented perfectionist. It's not just self-critical and hard on ourselves, but we can start to expect that same perfectionism from others. And I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that was really critical or judgmental yes. or really expected perfection from you, but it is exhausting. It's exhausting. And I don't think that the person exhibiting imposter syndrome really means to do that. You know, it's unintentional. Right. Well, well, I love that. Um, I have, let's see, another question when it is available on may 11th before just to kind of before we go into our rapid fire questions where will your book be available where can people get it um so the book is available on amazon right now and i believe also on barnes and noble and then so right now if somebody wants to get the book right now for the month of may just let me know because i have some really nice bonuses So anytime during the month of May, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So it's a really, really important month. So I was going to do this just for the book launch, just for this week, but I'm going to keep these bonuses open for the whole month and um, they can get it right online. And right now I've dropped the Amazon price for the Kindle version to the lowest I possibly can, which is $2.99. Right. Perfect. Oh, well, I mean, I hope everyone goes out and gets it, pre-order it. It is an amazing book. It will help you. It'll probably help you, I think, see deeper into yourself. And I want to, I mean, the, the I love the idea of mastering myself first before everything else, right? When we tell yeah. people you are the love you seek and you have everything within you to do whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, so something like your book can help in my opinion, someone achieve that level of emotional intelligence so they can do those things. So I highly suggest it to everyone. But um, okay, on that note, we're going to switch now into a little bit of a funner, you know, or funner. Did I? Oh, yeah, actually, that word is in the, it's in the dictionary right now, right? I can say it funner. <laughs> I can say yeah. it. Yeah. Um, rapid fire questions. We only have five for you. Um, and And so here we go. Let's see. The only thing I ask is answer them as authentically as you can. And, you know, you'll probably be surprised. If the toilet paper is really low, but not completely out, do you replace it or leave it for someone else? I replace it. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, yes, I, yes. I think my other question should be I'm going to have to if, if it do you do, which way is it turned right if it's coming from the bottom or from the top the the oh it has to come from the top yes 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 okay it has to <laughs> we can be friends now we can be friends no I'm kidding <laughs> um texting or talking uh it depends texting when I need to just kind of relay a message really really quick or it's just a fun like emoji kind of text talking when I really feel like there could be a misunderstanding if I just do it through text. Right. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And certainly to really connect to someone. Right. No, I totally agree with you. I do not feel people should argue or anything, you know, deep con don't do it over text. So I love that. Um, favorite day of the week? Oh, you know, every day of the week is the same for me these days. I think Sunday, Sunday's, Sunday's a good day. Yeah. We call it Sunday fun day. Yes. Yes. I, I'm always committed to a Sunday fun day. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Last question, actually, technically, since I threw that other one in for you. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Oh, definitely talk to animals. <laughs> oh, that's easy. I thought so. <laughs> Right? She's like, wait, I can't talk to animals. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I do anyway. Right, right. No, I love that. Well, you know, I just want to give you definitely some an opportunity, you know, to the people out there that uh, you, your story touches, like, what is your biggest message right now for the world? And especially with like what we're dealing with, you know, we have a lot of challenges headed our way, it seems. I mean, you know, we have such cont a contentious cultural environment right now. Mm -hmm. What is what is your focus and what is your biggest message for the world right now? First and foremost, you are enough. You are good enough. You are worthy enough. You are deserving. Um, and try, I would just say, hmm, my biggest message, you, you know, first, of, first and foremost, I think people have to remember that every storm runs out of water. The sun always comes up. Keep your hope up. Try to stay hopeful, whatever you're going through. And know that perspective is a big thing. A lot of times we'll put a lot of weight on something and it feels so big and it's like right in our face. And one of the things you can do is start to just give it some levity and give it some perspective. Is it really that big? How will you feel about that in about two or three months? And have you had other things that have come up that you've overcome and you've gotten through? Can you tell yourself a better story? Can you tell yourself, I will get past this. I may not know how right now, but this will get better. Tell yourself that story. Put yourself in the state that's going to best help you move forward. We don't always have control. In fact, I really don't believe in control at all. I think it's a myth, but we do have choice and we do have influence. So you can choose your thoughts. Oh, I love that. And yeah, that's the, trusting the process. You can only worry about the things that you can control. You know, yeah. in, in reality, we have um, and I say this like on a more serious note where you have people we have uh, reports that people in the coming years, as we're actually seeing it now, will be displaced. Um, we have climate change. We have wars. We have things. And, you know, even the worst things that can happen, like you said, this too shall pass. Good moments and bad moments, they come and they go. But like you said, everything, this too shall pass. You should never lose hope. So I love that that's your message. And I appreciate you coming and sharing your message here with us on Unsugar Coated with Alia. You know I appreciate you. You know I, can, I adore you. For our listening audience, please tell them where they can uh, support you specifically or in your social media? You know, I'm easy to find. It's just Cheryl and Jeanette, Cheryl with an S, S-H-E-R-Y-L and Jeanette, A-N-J-A-N-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. You can find me on social media. You know, you can find me on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Facebook. I'd love to connect with you. My book's available. It's really easy if you like to order from Amazon. It's available on Amazon, but you can also order it on Barnes & Noble if you prefer. And um, really, if you decide to get the book, use the book. Don't just read it. 
you know, this is not just your typical book. This book is a journey and it has more than, I shouldn't say more than, it has 20 exercises. So use the book. There's a lot of resources in there. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Cheryl. I appreciate you. And I will definitely see you on the flip side. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> to everyone else at home, thank you. Before we head out of here, don't forget, you look for ways to support Unsugarcoated Media, which is the 501c3 production company that produces Unsugarcoated with Alia, go to our website. Be sure to check us out, Unsugarcoated Media, on YouTube.com. We have our unisex hoodie, Live Empowered. I love this thing. It's so comfy, and it has a great message. So you can also support us. So win-win, right? Anyways, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for being with us. Until next week, thank you for letting us be Unsugarcoated. Take care. <laughs>